very good evening to all of you. So thank you all for logging in on time today. Uh, it's my pleasure in welcoming you all for the second session of the series on how to be investment ready, presented by Tai Chennai and Kiratsu Forum. The first session last week was on Are You Startup Ready? in which Mr. Subra covered the 18 point checklist on investment readiness. Today, the second session is going to be on various stages of funding and investor expectations for each stage of funding. With this, let me introduce the speaker of the How to Be Investment Ready series, Mr. R. Subramanyam Ayer. Mr. Subra is a forensic accountant independent director, angel investor, strategy consultant, focusing on business models, and an expert witness with over 30 years of work experience in Asia and Australia, and transaction, transaction experience in Asia, Europe, and the US. He is the co-president of Kiritsu Forum, Singapore and Chennai. Kiritsu Forum is the largest angel network in the world with 53 chapters and over 3,000 accredited investors. In the entrepreneur space, over the last decade, he has played a missionary role in guiding and assisting CEOs of small companies in South India and Southeast Asia through critical growth stages. In India and more broadly Asia, through his other ventures, Subra worked on understanding and addressing the severe shortage of resources in the small business sector, from financial capital to experience capital, relation capital and infrastructure. He was a partner with the Waterhouse Coopers, Singapore. In over 21 years with PwC, he has been an auditor, a tax due diligence, and in the 21 years with PwC, he led over 100 engagements of various sizes, including many that were cross-border for US and the European multinational corporations and private equity firms. He qualified with bachelor's in accountancy from the National University of Singapore and thereafter with the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Australia. He also completed the, his general management program at Harvard Business School in the fall of 2007 and is an alumnus of that school. So on behalf, behalf of Tai Chene and the participants here, I welcome you, sir, and invite you to take over today's session. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Saurav. Uh, good evening to everyone. Um, and as uh, Saurav mentioned, this is the second session out of six sessions on getting investment ready. Okay, um, next slide, sorry. Right, and so these are the six sessions. So last week we talked about, are you startup ready? Uh, in fact, some of the material that I used, I will be referencing it again today. Um, so if you, uh, you know, if you want that reference, uh, you know, just get it from Thai. Today I'll be touching on stages of funding and investor expectations. So the slides here are not uh, particularly heavy. So I, uh, I believe we could have uh, more interaction time today. And uh, maybe you guys should therefore think about questions that you want to ask. Uh, and... Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's just, it's just the way we need to break it, right, before we touch on fundraising, which is the next two sessions uh, broken up into business models uh, initially and then uh, how to go about the fundraise next. So the next slide, Saurav. Okay, just a break slide. Next one. Okay. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> Just give me a moment. Uh, this is a reference that um, you guys may want to get. I already shared it with uh, Tai Chennai last week uh, because the 18 points that I picked up for the session last week comes from uh, this particular uh, checklist. And I make some references uh, to it uh, for the purpose of today's presentation as well. Uh, from a slightly different context, um, but uh, it may be useful if, if you guys were not on the last week's session, you might still want to get it 
because it might sort of uh, give you a bit of a refresher on, on what was covered last week. So the next slide, Saru. Okay, let's come to stages of funding. Um, I have six of them. Um, right, so broken into two slides. The first funding is always from the founder, right? Whoever starts the business. This could be actual cash or this could be uh, salaries foregone. Could be any number of things, right? Because at the end of the day, if you're not putting skin in the game, no one else will. The second stage of funding is what we call FFF, which correctly stands for founder, family, and friends, but is euphemistically referred to as family, friends, and fools. And, and why do they say that, right? The reason is because this is very early um, in the stage of funding, and therefore the risk of the investment is actually pretty high. Right? And we will, you know, look in a, flu in a few slides down as to, you know, um, why, what are the expectations uh, of the FFF investors when they make an investment, right? Next, which is perhaps the most relevant and an and area where, uh, um, you know, I have quite a bit of experience is uh, the angel and the angel group. Uh, next slide. Right after that, it's uh, venture capital, and this is what we often refer to as institutional investors, um, because uh, when it comes to venture capital, it's not their money that they're investing; they're investing money on behalf of um, the limited partners, or what we call LPs, who would have invested uh, in the fund. Right, and then private equity. The honest truth is one to five is private equity, right? Because it's not public, right? And the reason that we create a category called private equity is merely to differentiate it from venture capital because private equity is when companies are larger, they are uh, pre-IPO or taking a listed company private uh, or it's a leverage buyout, right? So it's, it's probably an area which is not terribly relevant for startups, um, but just for completeness, I have included private equity. And of course there is public funding. And while public funding for early stage companies is very difficult in India, it is kind of normal uh, in many other parts of the world. Uh, in particular, the one that I know kind of well because uh, I have explored it and probably still have, have it at the back of the mind is to take uh, one of my Singapore startups uh, to public in on the ASX, which is the Australian Stock Exchange, right? So it's not like public funding is not relevant. Uh, I won't touch a lot on it because it's rare and it's difficult to do. Uh, you need to be at the right place, right time. And certainly for Indian companies in India is extremely difficult, right? <clears throat> so the, my presentation will largely uh, stop with the first four. And, and remember, in fact, all one to five is all private equity, right? Because it's private money as opposed to public money, which means that uh, other people are putting money into you through an exchange or something like that. Okay, the next slide. <clears throat> So I will just explain, uh, break down venture capital uh, into its various stages, uh, because you will come across these terms uh, quite a bit, so you should know what they mean, right? So venture capital uh, can, can come at various places, right? So they can invest in what we call the seed stage, which is typically uh, the area of angel investors, uh, seed stage, is uh, means what it says it is, right? It is seeding the company, right? <clears throat> Typically, it is a time when uh, you have, it's early stages of commercialization. You haven't quite established uh, the business model. The business model is evolving. So this is often referred to the seed stage. Um, generally, we associate seed stage with uh, angel investors, uh, but there are venture capital 
who allocate a portion of their funds to seed stage investments, or what we call really early stage investments. The second stage is often referred to as the growth stage. Uh, it can be, you would have uh, heard terms like series A, series B, series C. You know, you can have a series 1A, series uh, CA, series CB, and you know, or C1, C2, and it goes on and on and on, right? It's all irrelevant in the sense that they are merely descriptions of um, the stage that the company has grown into, right? Early stage, we are normally talking about seed. Uh, growth stage, growth stage uh, can be a series A, can be a pre-series A. Basically, it's a stage where your, the company is not quite 100% uh, institutional ready. Uh, some institutions may be prepared to invest. Uh, it needs to grow a little bit more before it gets to a valuation that, uh, and, and therefore uh, a fundraise size that would then qualify it to be called Series A. Uh, and then Series B when the company is larger, and, and I have a slide in between uh, to sort of show the stages and how the founders uh, stake in the company uh, dilutes over a period of time. Um, and you know, there is C, D, E, and you can break down each phase into multiple phase sub phases, um, which is merely indicative uh, of, um, you know, a, a company doing multiple fundraise. Um, basically, when I talk about angel investments, early stage investing, I, I would not go beyond a series B. Um, you know, my personal investments tend to be, um, you know, largely seed and growth. Um, very rarely do I do a series A and, and almost never do a series B. But basically, there's been a study which shows that uh, a study by uh, an organization in Singapore, whose founder I know quite well, which shows that later stage investments like a series D or series E often tends to mirror uh, the same returns as money that you would put in the capital markets, which means stock exchange, bonds, and all that kind of stuff, right? It's the early stage investments that's likely to give you a much larger return. But of course, they are also at a higher risk, meaning, uh, as I was, uh, you know, answering questions last week, you know, a third of your money may never come back, right? So I, I, again, I'll talk a little bit more when I go in depth on the venture capital. This is just to break down the stages of uh, venture capital. So the next slide. Okay, this slide is a bit hard to see, but you know, if you download the, uh, uh, the reference link that I have given, uh, you will see clearly. So basically this is what it shows, right? Um, what it shows is by the time that you complete your seed series, or uh, in which case I've included growth, that means uh, series, uh, pre-series A, you would find that the original investors would have diluted 25%, right? So you started with 100% of the company, you've gone to 75%. Then series A tends to be a much larger round and you find yourself typically uh, diluted to about 60%. And then you dilute further, when you do a series B, C, D, and so on, and you find that you know series B or C onwards, generally you lose uh, majority control, right? And which is why it's a big thing, right? So whenever we make investment decisions, we also look at the future uh, potential of the company, so that you know the fund raised in the early stages don't dilute the founders to below uh, 50%. Certainly at Series A, we don't want the founders to be below 50 because um, you know it's a little bit of an incentive, right? And the founders know the business. Often, uh, because uh, in later stages, you need more managers than you need entrepreneurs. But in the early stages, it's really entrepreneurship that builds the company, right? Um, so I always have a view on what the trend line is going to be um, you know, when investment decisions are made. And, and, and these are trade-off decisions in the sense that um, if you set valuations too high, um, nobody wants to invest in you. If you set the invest valuation uh, too low, 
you will find that you dilute too quickly, right? And basically the, the answer to this is the potential of the business. If the potential of the business is sufficiently good, then early stage investors will gain some comfort that the dilution of the founders uh, portion of the shares wouldn't be too great despite you know um, the amount of the investment ask right so next slide okay so moving on what are the investor expectations right you know as i said fff is often referred to as friends family and fools so what happens is why would they put money in you, right? So it's very simple reason. It's all about relationship. And at the end of the day, they would put money in you because they kind of trust you or they like you too much, right? So which is why the, the distinction between relationships and trust. Um, it is very difficult for you to raise angel capital at this stage. Of course, if you're a product company with significant engineering innovation, um, one of the ways uh, in which to do your early stage prototyping and development would be through accelerators. Is uh, Vijay here today? Mr. Entrepreneur here today? He was here yesterday, right? So you, you have uh, a lot of uh, people who actually run accelerators and that is a good way uh, to actually get early stage support before you actually raise uh, money even from angels, right? Angels are professional investors at the end of the day, right? Uh, next slide, Sarah. Okay, I'll spend a bit of time on, on angel investing. Now, what do angel investors expect, right? And really the answer is multifold. Uh, different angel groups expect different things. Um, before we started Keretsu, we actually studied uh, various angel organizations, uh, not just in India, but also in the United States. Um, and we found that there were groups that, uh, that invest in startups, mainly because they have money, uh, they are much older, and they feel that investing in startups is a way of staying young. So they tend to invest in companies very close to them. Uh, so this was a angel group uh, in, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And they would invest in companies in and around the Bay Area, right? So that whenever they feel like it, they can go visit the startup. And they had really no real expectations about how much they made on these investments. They were just happy that they hadn't lost money. Right, so you can have uh, angels who do that, uh, they invest. Um, some angels invest, or at least, you know, we have companies who come to us and said, you know, they've had angels who have invested in them at, you know, US, uh, 13,000 US, uh, 13 million US, and all this kind of thing. And normally we turn them away and said that if your valuation expectation is any higher than two or three million US, please don't see us, right? So sometimes you have angel investors who behave, you know, without any professionalism. They just like it uh, and they would put some money into it. But the problem with this kind of fundraise is that it's not sustainable, right? And you go and ask the, a more professionally run angel group, you know, please put money at 13 million US, even though, you know, I've only got a prototype and I haven't got my first customer. You know, the more professional ones will say, please go away. Then there are angel groups who invest only when there is full commercialization, in which case they are almost behaving like uh, venture capital, as opposed to the points two, three, and four, which I will touch on and, and talk about uh, a little later. Right? So some angels behave almost like uh, institutional investors. They want evidence of recurring revenue, and then they put money in. Right? But the, the true angel, and which is what we feel we are, is people who put money in when proof of concept is ready. What do I mean by proof of concept? Meaning that you actually have a product, which is, uh, you can pilot in the market, or you can make some uh, uh, minimum viable product sales uh, to sort of test it 
and maybe improve it. So that's an expectations. And generally in Keritsu, we never invest unless there is proof of concept at least. There should be a product market fit, means that you have a product that the market wants and the market is prepared to pay for. What an angel group like Keritsu is prepared to live with is uh, you may not have what I would call, and I would talk a little bit more about in the next session, is business model fit. Now, what do I mean by business model fit? Business model fit is when you can demonstrate that the customers are recurring and the recurrence will bring the company to profitability, right? So at the stage of uh, an initial angel investment, you're neither profitable, you probably have very little sales. You have proof of concept, maybe some pilot sales, uh, you know, some small number of sales. So therefore what I would describe as early commercialization, okay? So that's really the area where angels should invest. And the reason for investing at that stage is the return, right? If the company is successful, uh, and we'll talk about, you know, as I mentioned last week, you know, probably uh, uh, an angel, uh, you know, will invest at a point where, uh, you know, an angel investment, you know, a third of my investment I should write off the day I sign the check. A third, I kind of know I will get a middling return, maybe close to interest rates. And it's the last third that is going to do so well so that on a portfolio basis, I make an IRR of at least 30%, right? IRR meaning an annual yield of at least 30%, right? So that I beat uh, investing in even stock markets sometimes, okay? So, um, so to make that kind of return, the investments needs to be reasonably early. Um, so, you know, it can be, uh, at the time, usually at least proof of concept should be there, product market foot should be there in some early commercialization, um, not necessarily recurring revenue. Uh, we have invested when the companies were not even, didn't even have uh, revenues, but had a product, they were very close to securing and going to market. Right. Um, but there are angel groups that invest only if you have proven your business model and you have substantially more revenue and can prove that you know there is recurring revenue for your product right so that happens as well so you know if if you are raising money from angels or angel groups you will probably need to understand what is the expectations um, what they are prepared to invest in before you you know actually expose yourself um, to very detailed uh, discussions. Um, the, I, I noticed that there were a couple of discussions going on in, in, in the chat uh, as, as I was speaking. Proof of concept is not necessarily uh, a time when you have revenue. It could be well before revenue, um, but you cannot be too far away from early commercialization, right? So which means that you will actually have some revenue. But proof of concept is the product works, um, you know, you have a product and if it's like maybe an on-road product, you at least have the process of getting the required licenses in place and, and that sort of thing is, is what I call product market fit. And I talked a little bit about, you know, what is a product market fit um, last week. Um, the next slide. So the only other relevant stage for you is the venture capital right, or the VCs. And again, the investor expectation varies. For sure, at this stage, you must have business model fit. And what do I mean by business model fit? Meaning that uh, uh, there is actually repeat orders. Uh, there is a demonstrable path to profitability. Um, and more important than profitability is cash flow prof profitability. Uh, the investors need to know that within a number of years or, you know, in a very short order, um, you will get to the point of uh, sustained recurring revenue because even there, there is a risk, right? So, you know, when I describe the returns for angels, you know, a third they write off, a third 
they get some middling returns and a third does very well. In the case of VC, is the statistics is even harsher in the sense that um, they, re they rely on one third to make all the return and two thirds is written off, right? The reason angels do better with another third is because they are more involved as uh, private investors, as, angel in as opposed to institutional investors, which is what a VC is, in trying to help the company or at least find some sort of a sale or an exit. VCs don't do that, right? VCs don't want to waste time with companies that are not going anywhere. They just write it off, move on, and work hard on those that's going to give them the return that will again give them an IRR of 30%. And at the VC stage, traction is important. That means you've got repeat revenues, repeat customers, right? So they actually need you to demonstrate that there's going to be growth in revenue. And even more important, you know, you are not too far away on the operational cash generation. Now, different industries will have a different slant to these things. Um, one in particular is the healthcare industry, uh, particularly pharmaceuticals or devices, uh, because um, they are a bit more regulatory because they need things called, uh, you know, the, the uh, approval by the health authorities. In the US is the FDA. Um, I, I don't quite know what's in, uh, in India or in Singapore is the HSA, the Health Security Authority. Um, and, and, and the reason those companies are important is they often get sold even before they are commercialized. And why is that? The reason is because they often get bought out by the pharma majors who you know, don't want to spend all that money on R&D because they are very inefficient compared to a startup. They're just happy to pick up the startup with a great product with uh, maybe just completed uh, uh, the first clinical trial or maybe the second clinical trial and, and not gone on um, to the final clinical trial because uh, once they know that the product or solution is good, they, are, they have the distribution network to scale the business, right? So, you know, they exit uh, even before... Uh, um, they are actually showing, you know, huge revenues or operational cash, but they have demonstrated the potential growth of revenue and operational cash. So, so there, there are variants in all of these uh, depending on um, industry, um, but, you know, it's, um, uh, but, you know, the sort of flavor that I've given uh, during this is kind of give you a, a set expectations. Um, you know, as I said, today's uh, session is, is not particularly heavy. I also had a heavy day. So I'm happy to take questions and, and take questions on, on any aspect. So I'm just... Uh... Okay, so let me just look at questions. Um... Okay, I think one of the questions, can you explain how accelerators help? Uh, there's already an answer. They make you investment ready, customer acquisition. Actually, good accelerators also help you with uh, the prototyping of a product. Uh, and I have to say, in our experience in Karitsu Chennai, um, the institutions make very good accelerators, particularly IIT Madras. But, um, you know, slowly many of the other institutions, I think PSG in Coimbatore is also pretty good. Um, and many of the other institutes uh, whom uh, my partners in Chennai are working with uh, are also coming up to speed. So the way accelerators can help is really to help you get to a point where your product is actually robust enough to face the market, right? So they can help you from an engineering perspective. Um, and, and I have to say, uh, our investors in Chennai tend to be very pro engineering solutions. Uh, they don't believe a lot on the, uh, uh, on, on the e-commerce type of solutions, which may be okay with Bangalore investors and to some extent, uh, Bombay investors, but 
Chennai investors tend to be a lot more conservative. They're looking for real engineering solutions. So uh, for that kind of thing, accelerators really help with the prototype. And especially if they have huge resources, as many of the universities do, you know, they help you with the testing. And the other way that, you know, institutions can help is because they have a relationship as universities with um, some of the largest companies uh, operating in, in the location, right? So if it's uh, Chennai, then operating in Tamil Nadu. And those relationships can be really, really useful for early commercialization or early pilot customers for these startups, right? So invest, so accelerators can really help uh, in many ways. And of course, IIT Madras also has got a separate healthcare uh, accelerator because healthcare is a slightly more difficult space because of the regulations, uh, safety, and, and all aspects of it. Um, then the question, POC is not always revenue positive. That's correct, right? But proof of concept actually means that you, the product is ready, right? So you at least need to be a minimum viable product. Uh, you have a product that you get to take to market. Um, you know, we have made investments where, you know, the company pretty much had a ugly black box when we invested in them. And it took them three to four years before they have something which uh, the customers are actually saying, this is great, right? So POC can sometimes be a long process. I mean, you may earn revenue, you know, over that two, three years, not, not great revenue, um, but you actually haven't got the product, right? Uh, that the market actually wants, right? So there is a product market fit, but it's not translated itself into wowing the customers, right? Such that the customers would keep coming back, would recommend you to others. You know, that, you know, on, on with many of the startups, especially uh, deep tech type of startups, uh, IoT type of startups, you know, where actually you have a, a real product, you know, uh, that you can touch and feel, it can take quite a bit of time. Okay, someone is asking, is it possible to get all four lectures, actually six lectures in this series? I think uh, Tai is uh, taping all of them. So I suggest you approach Tai. Then I have a question, do hospitals attract investors? You know, the interesting question about hospitals, is this uh, an infrastructure play? Uh, is this a product? Is it a service, right? So as I was talking about um, products and services, uh, yesterday it's a bit of a generalization that generally investors prefer to invest in products because uh, there is a greater ability to scale right i can see an early stage investment translating to possibly a 10x return right which is how we evaluate early stage investments right that's what that's how angels and to some extent vcs look at it right is there a 10x investment now investing in a hospital is not a 10x investment. So they don't attract angel investors. They attract a different kind of investors who are happy to take security on the underlying infrastructure, right? On the underlying asset, the land. So yeah, hospitals can attract investors if, if they are interesting enough, uh, they're doing something that is different, but you find that it is not in the space of angels. Uh, for angels to invest in hospitals is really difficult. There's no 10x return and individual angels don't really have the wherewithal to sort of assess the underlying risk, right? So assume that you invest in a, hotel, a hospital and it doesn't go anywhere because it's very competitive and others have a much better presence. You find that, uh, you know, a, a normal angel can't do anything with the asset, right? You can't sort of say, okay, strip the hospital, let's uh, develop something else in the thing. But someone who's a bit more institutional and deep pocketed would say, okay, even if the hospital fails, I can do something with the real estate. Okay. So hospitals are not what I would call a uh, typical for a angel space or a, even a VC space, but it attracts a different kind of investors, right? Not, not the type I know well, uh, but it has its own uh, attractions. Uh, there are also, uh, investments that are focused on what we call real estate or infrastructure plays. 
um, they tend to be institutional, they tend to be larger. Um, and again, they wouldn't do an early stage hospital, but you know, if they sort of find the hospital is set up, maybe it's got some good name or good name recognition or good uh, recognition of doctors, they might be interested. Okay, then the, the next question on strategic investments, right? So we can break investments into two types. One are financial investors, the, the other is strategic investors, right? Who are financial investors, which is all the people that I talked about, right? Which is angels, venture capital, private equity, they're all uh, financial investors, right? Uh, they're basically looking for a return. Now, startups do sometimes attract strategic investors. Uh, I think a case in point uh, would be um, one of the IIT companies that makes electric uh, motor vehicles, Ather, who got a strategic investment from, um, from Hero, right? Because Hero also makes motorcycles and instead of trying to play with electric motorcycles within they are infrastructure, they are happy to take a strategic investment in an early, early year stage. I think uh, Aether has gone a few rounds of uh, funding. So they may be at series B or C, I, I don't know. Um, and you could have uh, someone like uh, uh, a strategic investor like this. Now, strategic investment is good or bad if they, you know, they are more deep pocketed. So they can take a sizable chunk of the shares. They may not get majority, as I showed the dilution graph uh, earlier. You know, until uh, Series B, you know, the founders often still hold majority, and certainly even at Series B, the founders, together with the early stage investors, right, the angels, the VCs, could still hold majority before strategic investors have come in. Now, the problem with strategic investment is knowing what is the agenda of the strategic investor. Because uh, as deep pocketed large companies, they may have a different agenda from what the founders uh, might have. So it's not that strategic investment is bad, but knowing who the strategic investor is and what their likely agenda is, uh, you really need to understand, okay? And the question on valuation, I will pop for the last session. So I'll talk a little bit more about valuation on this. I need to break this up because otherwise it becomes pretty heavy and, and not too focused. Right, so comments of Keritsu Dubai, that's fine. Not sure what the other one means. Okay, what's the difference between an angel investor and a venture capitalist? An angel investor is purely an, an individual, right? So I'm an angel investor, right? And you have an angel group like Kiritsu Forum. It's not Kiritsu Forum that invests. It's, it's members who invest in the individual capacity. Sometimes they make a group together and form a special purpose vehicle, but the bottom line is there are individuals, right? So, um, so an angel investor is really an individual or groups of individuals who are making an investment into your company. A venture capital is what we call an institutional investor. So the venture capital will create, uh, you know, so if you take investment from a venture capital, the venture capital invests in its own, own name. I mean, it might create an intermediate vehicle for risk management purposes but it has pooled the funds, right? So what happens, you know, with the angel investor, if you want to raise one crore, you may need to raise from 10 people, right? With a venture capital, even if you want to raise three crores, one venture capital may be able to sign the check, right? So that's the difference, right? So venture capital is something you go for um, a bit late, later in the piece because the venture capital's expectations, as I talked about earlier, is, you know, they, they want you to have already demonstrated uh, business model fit, right? Meaning recurring customers, there's a path to cash flow, neutrality, profitability, and all that sort of thing, which an angel investor is prepared to overlook, right? And sort of fund an idea just because they personally fancy the, the idea, right? So that's what the difference is. There's difference between an, indi an individual and an institution. 
Um, so the question of the accelerator, I think I've touched on. If uh, my answer is not good enough, please raise the hand, ask more. Right, uh, next one, a first release of MVP, which means minimum viable product. We found that our product is seen more of a vitamin than a painkiller by the customers. And the customers didn't find it compelling to try the product, pay, unfold. <laughs> well, at, at least you, you found out at the MVP stage that product market fit is a problem, right? So uh, this is the question, right? So if you have a product market fit problem, what should you do, right? One is really ask your question, you know, should you go back to the drawing board and redesign the product, right? In this case, it's, uh, it's a medicine that you thought uh, was, uh, should be a painkiller, but it's seen as a vitamin, right? So somewhere the prototyping of the product has not worked, right? So my idea is go back to the draw drawing board, right? So you have indeed two options. One is, okay, everybody thinks it's a good vitamin, in which case you sell it as a vitamin. The problem with that is there's dime a dozen of vitamin sellers. And the question is whether you can compete in such a market. Uh, there may be less people sending painkillers, but if people don't see that in your solution, but usually if it's a painkiller, you would need to go through the regulatory process. So I'm not sure you could have ever taken it out as a minimum viable product. And our experience with uh, something that is uh, pharmaceutical in nature, you will find in the team of the company or in, uh, in their advisory list, um, true scientists. Um, and I gave an example uh, last week about a company that is uh, treating viruses in a different way from uh, vaccines or other medications. So it's also relevant to COVID it actually breaks the um, membrane of the cells. Uh, so they are creating a completely new class of um, pharmaceuticals. Um, and, and the reason uh, many of our investors have taken them seriously is just um, the CV of the scientists on their panel, which is so difficult to replicate. So anything in the pharma space is actually not easy. Um, and it, it takes a long time before uh, the angel investor actually gets a return. But if the product is successful, the return can be phenomenal. And often these companies are uh, knowledge companies, so they won't do the distribution. Uh, once they've gone through at least uh, first stage or second stage of the clinical trial, they will sell it to uh, one of the big pharmas who have the distribution network, right? So, you know, who, what, what are your relationships? So the founders, do they have relationships? Do they have advisors who can give them relationships to the, um, to the um, you know, uh, pharma players who've got the distribution reach? So things like that become extremely important if you get into the space of uh, healthcare. How are investments done in C stage? Um, in, you know, seed stage investments are rarely done as a loan in the sense that whether you put it in as a loan or whether you put it in as capital, the risk is the same, you know, the failure risk of an early a seed stage startup is extremely high. So most early stage or seed stage investments, it is, they usually raise capital and you can raise the capital in n number of ways. You can raise it as a convertible. Uh, or you can just issue, you know, fresh capital, right? Or you can have, and, and many companies also issue preference shares because uh, they want to uh, limit the voting rights of uh, early stage investors at that time. Uh, even though many early stage investors, as we do in Kerit, so we, we ask for at least uh, observer status in the board discussions. Uh, even Many people don't want to be directors uh, because of the, fiduciary risk that comes with it, but we often ask for observer rights. So early stage uh, is rarely a loan. Uh, you might get small loans just to help you through until you raise your first round. Um, but generally it's always uh, equity.
Will Angel Group be interested in investing in company who has a prototype ready but no customer? Well, if your product is compelling and it has huge potential, um, I think Angel Groups will look at you. Um, it is often case to case. Um, and as I mentioned, many of uh, our credits and investments, particularly IIT Madras companies, we have invested pre revenue. Um, but the products were compelling. Uh, the people behind it were excellent. Uh, there was, uh, you know, senior participation. So in, in, in our case, a couple of professors participating in it. So it's, it's a question of how compelling uh, the total package is, right? So it's not a must to have customers, um, but, you know, um, but it is difficult if, if, if the product is not compelling enough. Who is an accelerator? How is it different from Angel? I think I've answered the question. If I haven't, you know, um, please raise the hand and, and we can go back to it. I missed the initial part of the recording. Yep, okay. Um, you know, please get in touch with Ty. Get a copy of the recording. If investors invest seed stage up as loans, can the founders request uh, instead of profit? Okay. Now, um, actually many uh, early stage investments in the US, places like the US and Singapore, uh, is often done as a convertible. And what's a convertible? A convertible is nothing but a loan that will at one point convert into equity, right? Or shares in the company. Um, in India, there is a bit of a problem because only directors can give loans. And often if the loans attract an interest and you have a foreign investor, you have all kinds of chaos uh, in an exchange control place like India, right? So people don't do loans in India, right? Although it is uh, convertible loans are, uh, are just the way it's done in many other parts of the world. And now, how does these convertible loans work? Well, you can have a coupon, uh, which is the interest. Now, uh, early stage companies typically never pay out the interest, right? So what happens is you have a coupon of 8%. So depending on when you invested, from the day you invested, it accumulates this 8%, right? So you have this loan plus interest accumulating up to the point where it gets converted into capital in the company, which is shares in the company at a later point in time where you have external reference value, right? Meaning some big investor or invest, uh, institutional investor is invested and you now have a benchmark value. And therefore this loan plus the coupon, which is not actually paid, but is accumulated, is then converted into shares of the company, right? So, uh, so you can structure it in that way. It's just that it is extremely hard and, and, and all kinds of legal issues in an Indian environment, which is peculiar to India, partly because of, uh, um, because a lot of startup laws in India are still ancient uh, by global standards. Okay, this is even more confusing for me. Sir, in a marketplace model, um, which uses video AR for discovery, for bookings. Okay, this is a harder question for me to answer. See, um, let, let's simplify what I mean by POC, right? What is a proof of concept? The proof of concept is uh, you have a product or service or an offering that a market is prepared to pay, to pay for, right? So you have a product market fit. And the product is ready for early commercialization. So maybe something like this, you have a minimum viable product, you can take a certain volume of activity and you actually put out there in the market and there are people who are beginning to use it. That's POC, right? You know, I, I don't want to get into the detail of whether you have all aspects of the POC, but basically um, when I talk about business model, when I talk about product market fit, it's that when, when you have a startup and you have an offering, you have a value proposition. Now,
the value proposition must be compelling enough for a particular customer segment, right? And when you have B2C, the problem with B2C is C can be the world, or maybe C is just your name, right? So you, you need to define what is your initial market segment, uh, and then say that this value proposition is actually attractive enough for these customers to come back, pay money for it, right? That's POC, right? Now, if you have to deliver all aspects of customer acquisition, engagement, and retention, then you know that's a different thing, right? So by POC, I basically, all I'm interested in, you have a value proposition that a customer segment or a limited customer segment is at least interested in paying for, right? And to me, keep POC simple enough uh, to that point. How much investors will be interfering my day-to-day -day business affairs? Again, you know, varies from uh, investors to investors. Most of us who are professional in our outlook really don't want to interfere in you, right? We will interfere if things are not going in the way we expect, right? In which case, you know, we'll call for a meeting and say what we like, what we don't like, and sort of agree on next steps. So by and large, you know, like um, as an angel investor, I probably have 40 investments, right? Some of it is in different countries. There is no way I could interfere in, in the business that I've invested in. Doesn't mean that I'm not in touch. Doesn't mean that I don't get updates. Uh, in fact, Carissa Forum does, a, uh, you know, does update sessions uh, because, uh, you know, many of our companies have received uh, multiple investment, multiple rounds of investments from just angels. So, um, so the answer is the really professional angels don't uh, interfere day to day. They want you to get on with the business, but they'd like to be kept informed, right? So you can design, and, and many of the companies we've invested in have designed uh, you know, a reporting mechanism and they report quarterly or half yearly so that the investors know what's going on. Um, Often uh, investors make a call and find out what's going on. And, and if they directionally don't like something, then they would call for a larger investor group meeting and sort of say, okay, what we like, what we don't like. Okay, what does traction mean? Traction means, are you winning customers? Are you winning repeat customers? That means the customer buys now, comes back and buys again. Are you adding customers, right? Are you growing revenue? That's what traction means. Seed stage investments, uh, can it be capital or CC pairs? It can be either. Um, and, um, um, you know, it's a, it's a uh, you know, you, you have a lot of valuation issues um, when we make angel investments, right? As an angel investor, I will never accept an extremely high valuation for the simple reason is that it's my hard earned money and the risk of failure is pretty high, right? So until you have lost money, you actually don't understand how important that is, right? And why do we don't want a high valuation? Because I know that I need to make a really good bucket loads of money on one third of my investments, right? Because I know a third I'm going to write off, a third I would hardly get much of a return, right? Maybe interest rate returns. So the only way that can happen is for early stage investments. That's for angel investments. The valuation need to be attractive enough and there is a path, right? Whether it happens or not, you know, is, is another story. But at least there's a path to a 10x return, right? Right? So if we evaluate every investment and see, well, you know, is there a potential for a 10x investment? Doesn't matter if it happens in five years, doesn't matter if it happens in seven years, sometimes even longer, right? But when you can do a 10x investment, usually the IRR adds up, okay? So, uh, right? Now, sometimes we don't want to spend a huge amount of time debating the valuation, right? Because if you're doing capital, right, which means share capital, right, you're issuing uh, common shares, you need to fix this valuation, right? Because you cannot change the number of shares later. So the CCPS is a way of getting around it, right? You could sort of say, right, we will set the 
the value based on my subsequent round when I raise a substantial amount of money. Maybe I'm raising five crores or 10 crores at that time. So based on which, you know, it's a sizable investment, maybe even from an institutional investor. And we will set the value at that stage and you will get an X percent discount to that value so that you have some return for the period from when you invested and the time of the thing, right? So when I talk about transaction documents, I will be introducing another concept in when we talk about CCPS, which is what's called valuation cap, right? So we could do an, and when you do a next round fundraise, you could have said that the early investors can convert at a 20% discount to that uh, value, right? Subject to a cap of maybe 10 crores, right? So if, you, if that valuation is 20 crores, they get to, uh, in, instead of doing 20%, 80% of 20 crores, they convert at 10 crores, right? Which is the cap, which means that's the highest value at which they will convert, right? So there are all these kinds of complications that come in um, and each of them have their pros and cons. You end up in all kinds of debates around it. Um, and therefore, uh, each of us as individual investors or angels uh, drift towards uh, a preference, right? And I talk a little bit more about it in the last session because I will then be talking about valuations. I will then be talk about investment documents. So, you know, I, I'll say a lot more about the piece, but, you know, um, all of these are possible ways to invest. Each of them have their pros and cons. Um, question about wellness space, Ayurveda, yoga. I know there was a yoga company that raised some money. The issue with services businesses is their ability to scale, right? As I said, where will I get a 10x return? Very rarely on, uh, on these type of companies. Although, you know, product, I mean, the thing with Ayurveda companies, they can create a product, right? And, 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 and there are some of those in India who've done very well. But, you know, these are very difficult to evaluate, right? So, um, so many of us who have uh, seven, eight years experience in angel investments tend to avoid the services space because it's just very, very difficult. Ours is a SaaS product and we are buy to get it. So, you know, go ahead, you know, let the staff look at it before it comes to SVK on how to look at it, right? As I said, you know, um, value proposition needs to be compelling, right? And it's just that the bias uh, with our investors in Chennai tends to be towards product solutions because they believe it. Um, the, the, the problem, they tend to be a little bit skeptical about SaaS products, uh, IT products is because uh, many of our members also come from an IT background and their feeling is, look, if we put enough money into it, Anybody can copy and develop the same thing, right? So, so there is some of that issue that one needs to deal with if you are a technology, if, if you are a software solution. Is there a way for retail investors to invest in startups? Yeah, it's a real problem. Uh, I was associated with a company that tried to do this. Uh, what's called Grex, but uh, unfortunately SEBI is, uh, even though they engaged with SEBI right from the day that they wanted to start it with, SEBI just pulled the plug on them and they're almost dead, right? So um, it's, right now there is no investor, there's, there's no way you can have retail investors investing in startups. Because when you say retail investors, you're talking about public as opposed to private, right? Because it could be anybody and everybody, right? Um, there were attempts to try and do this, but you know, I think in the Indian regulatory environment, we're still a long way from this. What percentage return expected by angels VC? Typically IRR 30% US dollar is the IRR one looks for. So if you think that Indian rupee is a depreciating currency, you should add a few percentages to that. So 
it 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 basically works on a 25 to 30 30% irr right and 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 therefore the the period of time doesn't matter right if that's just that if it um, if it takes longer you need a multi, uh, higher multiple right to achieve the same irr Why is it that angel investors are not interested in low risk incremental return business? Uh, it's the, it's, you know, uh, I've often talked about, right? One third of the investments, they don't get money back. One third, um, they get a middling return and one third makes them the real 10 X, right? So that they can make a reasonable return. Now, why don't they do low risk incremental return businesses? You know, you can do debt, but the problem with debt to an early stage company has the same risk as equity in that business. So unless you sort of say you are a little bit more stable and uh, someone who gives you debt can be assured of, a, of an interest that's better than a bank rate, then some, there may be people who would look at it because they like the fact that you know, maybe there's a quarterly uh, return, there may be a an half yearly return or an annual return. But it really comes down to the risk return equation. So for early stage companies, the risk of debt and the risk of equity is the same. Uh, so, you know, so that's why people look for the returns, right? And, and sometimes we need very high returns so that uh, um, it, it can cover the losses that the investors will also have to bear. How to differentiate between an investor who's trying to enter and exit with profit from investors trying to acquire the startup from the founders? Well, if it's a financial investor, they are basically interested in entering and want to exit with a profit. End of story, right? An investor who is trying to acquire the startup is typically a strategic investor. Um, so, they must be someone who kind of think that if this company does well, we can actually scale this and therefore we should invest early, take, take a risk with uh, a, a small amount of money, a small uh, for, for an institutional investor. And let's see how they go. And if, they, uh, if they're able to grow the revenue, then you know, given that we are an early investor, we have the first right to pick it up and we know the information and maybe we can make a, an offer that is attractive enough for the founders to sell to us, right? So basically you look at the investor and make an assessment as to whether the person is a financial investor, right? So someone like me investing, um, you would know I'm a financial investor when it comes to my angel investments because, you know, if, if I say I've got 40 investments, there's no one company I'm going to acquire from the founders, right? So you look at the profile of the investor and, and you could come to a pretty good judgment about it. Do some angel investor great debt funding rare because of the difficulties I just explained? Um, for early stage companies, uh, debt risk, equity risk is the same. So I'm a single founder startup. Okay, I, I, I touched on this uh, question about uh, you know, uh, people like to have two or three founder team rather than a single founder, uh, which we covered in the first session. Um, um, so that's fine. I mean, investors do prefer, uh, not that they don't invest in a, a single founder team, but they, a single founder startup. Um, but generally, you know, from a risk mitigation perspective, they prefer a team. So it's fine. I mean, you know, as long as the your ESOP or other consideration that you are prepared to pay your other founding members is attractive enough or compelling enough for them to stay and especially stay through the hard times, right? Which is some, which is a theme that I talked a little uh, bit about uh, earlier. Uh, I, I talked a bit about uh, even uh, uh, at last week. So earlier question, is it Grex? Yeah, Grex, G-R-E-X was uh, was the company that was trying to create an alternate uh, uh, alternate exchange you know working with sebi but 
you know, um, Sebi was just not helpful. Okay, um, I'm not sure I, you know, I thought I've answered the question, what is equity, seed stage, angel? Right, so, you know, we're mixing uh, multiple things. Uh, you know, uh, each thing is different. Equity alone is the type of instrument uh, that you look for and, and many early stage investments tend to be equity, whether common shares or convertibles or CCPS as in India. Uh, stages, uh, are you at a C stage, a growth stage, a series A, series B? It depends on where you are in your evolution as a company. Um, and I'm not sure what you mean by angel differences. If I haven't answered, you know, just raise a question here. Um, following up question, is there a model developed countries? Um, I think what's uh, happened with, uh, there's not a lot of models uh, of uh, retail investors investing in startups. Um, one of uh, the exceptions is uh, the Australian exchange, uh, where you could take a startup to the ASX if your post listing valuation is at least a 15 million Aussie dollars, which is kind of uh, reasonably easy to do. Uh, 15 million is not as high. Um, you can do a startup in a place like Singapore, but the expected uh, post investment valuation is uh, sing dollar 80 million, right? Which is a bit harder to do. Um, and then, of course, you have, you know, um, early stage companies, maybe not seed or growth, but maybe uh, Series C, Series D companies, which often uh, get listed on NASDAQ even though they're loss making, but have compelling product or growth stories. And, and NASDAQ is of course the uh, technologies market in the United States, right? So, um, so there are such uh, uh, institutions that allow it. Um, not that many, I have to say. Okay. Um, Saurav, uh, Jawahar wants to ask a question. Can you unmute him? Yeah. Yeah, Jawahar. Okay. Sir, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sir. Uh, so this is Jawahar from Coimbatore. Very wonderful presentation, sir. So I could get a lot of uh, insights you know, without knowing anything about angel investments, uh, you know, I uh, watched your sessions and I got to know a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, sir, my question is, you know, I, I didn't understand the part that you talked about three parts, right? One part, the angel investor is making money, the other is risk and the third part. So, you know, can you please explain that portion of it? You know, I want to understand from the angel pers uh, investor perspective, you know. The risk return equation, right? Yeah. So, as I said, you know, goes, goes back to the story. If as an angel investor, I make an investment, right? Okay. The uh, history tells me, right? History and, and the markets that have been studied is largely the United States, but it kind of generally applies uh, almost anywhere in the world, unless you're an extremely good or extremely bad investor, right? So take an average investor. A third of the investment you make, you will never see a return, right? So if you had put 10 lakhs, you'll get zero back. Okay. A third of the investments, if I put 10 lakh, right, maybe I'll get a 10% return per year. And therefore at the end of one year, I'll get 1.1 lakh, uh, 1.1 lakh back, right? Okay. Now, my third investment is what over a period of three years, five years or seven years will give me a, uh, a 10x return which normally equates to something close to a 50% IRR. That means if I put one lakh today, at the end of the year, it's really worth one and a half lakhs, okay? okay? Now, the, the reason an, an angel investor looks at this is as a portfolio, I lose one lakh, right? I've invested three lakhs. At the end of one year, I got 1.1 plus 1.5. It's actually not enough, right? It's a loss. So actually the third one will do much better than that, right? But if you take over a period of time, for my three lakh investment, 
mm. I will get uh, at the end of one year at least uh, four lakhs, right? Meaning about a thirty percent return. Okay. Now, how do I get a four lakhs return, knowing that out of the three lakhs, one lakh is going to disappear, right? Okay. One lakh will give me a small return. Okay. So I need to make a huge return on the last one third. Okay? okay. So what happens is I evaluate every investment to see that if it falls into that last one third, right? Because I don't know, and and really you can never know, right? The risk of early stage investing is extremely high. I can never know which of the companies will fail and will become, I'll get zero money back. Uh, which of the companies, you know, will give me a middling return, maybe, you know, a bit better than interest rates and which companies will do it, right? So I evaluate all of them on the basis that it would really give me a good 10x return over five years or seven years or whatever, right? So that's really the, the, the point about uh, investment returns, okay? So now what's the other question? Risk, right? So the risk is this, right? The risk is I may get nothing. So that's the real risk, okay? So, uh, so what do we do? We put small amounts into a large number of companies, right? It's what's called portfolio theory. Uh, and portfolio theory is so important for angel investments because it is a high risk high risk stage, right? Um, you're also betting on the founder. What if the founder just gives up one day and walks away? It's happened before. Uh, we've heard, we've seen many of these stories, right? And uh, as we said, and if the founder leaves, the product fails. I'm not to go, go after the founder. This is angel investments. You, you take that risk, right? So how do you mitigate that risk? You take a portfolio view and say, as a portfolio, if I make a 30% IRR, I'm done. I'm happy. Okay. okay. So what was the other question? Did I answer the question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You did. So, yeah. so you know, just, just because, you know, the risk is very high in angel investment. My other question is, uh, as an angel investor, do you handhold them in the initial stages? Uh, you know, till what time do you handhold them? You know, so that Ooh. your risk is mitigated. Okay. So as an angel group, right? So as Kiritsu Forum, we tell our members that they should risk anything between three and 5% of their financial assets in angel investments, right? So, you know, you can't tell people, you know, you can put all your money and get away with it. I mean, it's, it's really not true, right? That would be irresponsible of us, right? To go and tell our, our members, you can invest as much as you like and don't worry about it. Just doesn't work. Yeah. Right. So you basically say, you know, uh, take a sensible risk appetite. You know, uh, and, and usually three to 5% of the financial worth, you know, is not going to affect their lifestyle, even if all of it failed, right? So that's typically how we advise people to, uh, to manage their risk, right? Now, if you are an active angel investor and, and you frequently participate in the companies you have invested in, maybe you can risk a bit more of your capital, right? Instead of taking three to 5%, maybe you can move it to 15, 20, or even 25 percent, right? And unless, of course, you're extremely rich, right? In which case, you can you can invest 90 percent and not worry if nothing comes back. So it, it's that kind of uh, uh, equation, right? So yeah, one needs to tell angel investors that you know um, take take a responsible amount of risk. So so if there are a group of angel investors, then then one person takes the lead and then he interacts with the Company. So one person or maybe two people uh, would do the interactions and then we as an institution will provide the support, right? Because uh, we do have five, six years of uh, angel investment experience in India, uh, gone through a lot of the documents, uh, all the uh, documentation. We've also gone through the ups and downs. Uh, we've seen companies do well. We've seen companies do badly. So we kind of have learned a few things and, and I touched on some of these profile things uh, uh, in the last session and then we will cover some other aspects in the subsequent sessions. So your hand holding is to a certain level, right? And then you, you let them be on their own, right? So you are involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of the company to a certain no, level? No? no way. No, no way. Okay. No way. Nobody has got time to be day-to-day -day involved okay. uh, in the affairs of the company. We don't. We don't. See, the thing is, if I need to get involved in to the day-to-day -day running of the company, then I shouldn't make that investment at all, right? It's, it's like saying, I don't even trust the founder. 
then that's an investment one shouldn't make okay okay sir thanks a lot sir have a nice yeah. yeah okay there's another uh, other than financials and other details about the startup what do investors expect from Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what do I look for in a in a founder? Um, you know, one of my partners uh, um, said something um, very correct about ent- entrepreneurs. Right? Entrepreneurship is twenty percent knowledge. Right? So, um, or, or let's say twenty five percent knowledge. Right? So, like what you're hearing today. um maybe you take a course on entrepreneurship at one of the institutes right so that's knowledge right how to run a business how to keep basic set of books um is something that you need to have now all businesses need a certain amount of luck right which is let's say 5% luck right and as they say luck is when um, preparation meets opportunity right so it's a bit of effort and 70% of on, on entrepreneurship is nothing but attitude right so what do i mean by attitude it means resilience it means knowing that it will not always be good times there are times you'll run out of cash can't pay salaries you have got to scramble get help pull people pull resources speak to the other founders share the pain and still at the at the at the same time motivate the team to continue developing the product to a point where you can raise substantial capital and go to market right so so that's what i look for in a founder right a founder who will not give up easily um, will fight to build the product is passionate about it so in fact all of these things are perhaps even more important than the financials because the financials and the projections that you put together as an early stage company is as good as the paper you've written on it right really right sure we can challenge some of the assumptions we can ask some difficult questions but it's not really all that special okay it's is very difficult to assess so often you know there's a friend of mine you know who made some really large investments in the early days when india opened up uh, so this is going back 20 years or so and i used to ask him how did you make these investment decisions and he told me i looked in the eyes of the entrepreneur right i think there's an extreme answer but there is a good point to it which is can you trust the founder can you is the person resilient enough to go through tough times is the person um uh flexible enough will listen will test new ideas uh, because really what you're doing at early stage investments is you're continuously testing your business model and and I'll touch a little bit on business models next week because your business model is not static right so if you go into the business thinking that i will only do it this way you find that it's going to fail right because often you need to adapt change because the market's not with you right you have to adapt to the market so those are the kind of skills that i am possibly looking for how has covid impacted investment decisions um yeah um i think the answer is uh, it has had an impact um many of our members came to us and said look you know um don't show us new companies because you know let's go and talk to the companies we've already invested in because they may have struggled so I, i'd rather keep my powder dry instead of putting in new companies let's go back uh, look at the older companies um valuations did come under pressure um and we told some of the companies that instead of uh, raising the large amount that you were preparing for why don't you raise raise a smaller amount from existing investors just make your valuation more attractive um cycles have pushed out especially in you know institutional investments take longer um the other thing that also affected investments is um as i said angel investing is only a portion of their portfolio and many investors uh, suffered in the stock market you know um, at, at the worst point i think which was march of this year 
yeah, stock markets were down up to about 30%. So many people didn't want to liquidate their investments to put into angel investments. So, so there was an issue uh, of uh, cash. Uh, we did see that. Um, but, you know, um, everything is a process, right? But even during this period, some invest, uh, some companies have continued to attract sizable investments. And I have to say, um, from what I've seen, uh, certainly in Singapore, and maybe to some extent in Chennai, certainly in Singapore, is the healthcare businesses have attracted uh, a lot more serious investment. Um, which means more sizable. So uh, one of the companies I talked about last week and this week, you know, a company that's looking at treating viruses by destroying the membrane, you know, which is a completely new way of dealing with viruses, right? So in a COVID world, that's extremely attractive. Um, and um, a, a company that has done multiple angel rounds and perhaps uh, maybe no more than a year or a year and a half away to being picked up uh, by uh, pharmaceuticals at a potentially good valuation. So that kind of companies have attracted uh, investments. Um, so I, I, I tend to think that most of the members I interact with, both in, in Chennai as well as in Singapore, really like some good quality solutions, right? As opposed to just another platform play. Platform plays um, e-commerce models tend to be tend to be viewed with a lot more suspicion because they don't know whether it's the only one, whether it's defensible, whether they really have intellectual property can be defended, right? So I think that's a long answer to probably a short question, but it gives it the perspective. Any other questions? Anyone wants to put a hand? Yeah, I didn't want to mix a topic from the later sessions with today's session, which is why today's uh, set of slides are a bit uh, quicker to run through. So we have time for questions. How much time we still have, Sara? So we have another eight minutes. Yeah. yeah I think participants who have any questions, you can raise your hand. Uh, I'll be able to unmute you. Sir? Sir, can you hear me? Oh, Jawahar? Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, since we have time, I thought, you know, I could ask you this question, sir. Uh, yeah. Sir, uh, like, have you uh, invested in any kind of, like, you know, gardening companies? I mean, horticultural companies where, you know, uh, home gardening where you make vegetables and, you know, things like that. Or in greenhouses. Or you know, have you invested in those kind of companies in the U.S. or in Singapore or urban uh, urban farming? You know, uh, where you grow greens uh, inside buildings, those kind of projects. I I, I haven't. Um, I I have come across many um, because it was a space I used to be kind of excited about. Okay. But I lost money on an investment into a uh, with a specialty vegetable. Uh, agribusiness out of uh, Uti. Uh, it's run out of Coimbatore. Okay. Um, so I, I find that in the agri space, market determination is not so easy. Uh, and there is a huge uncertainty about the price at which you can take your produce to market. Okay. And I find determining that extremely difficult and therefore determining the profitability is extremely difficult, right? And then you have the exposures to whether you have the exposures that the market doesn't happen or your distribution channel is affected and therefore your, your produce waste, okay? okay? So my answer is in this space, it's very difficult. I mean, I, I've become very skeptical because I have lost money. Um, I would invest if, the company has a fairly secure supply chain, okay. right? Meaning that 
I know that they have their supply chain well in order and therefore they have distribution fully in place, then I may be prepared to take that risk. But I would say it's a very difficult space, right? And, and when uh, we look at uh, deep tech, I, I actually view agri tech with a lot of caution uh, because not just in India, also in other parts of the world, in, in Indonesia, in uh, Papua New Guinea, some of the places where I've had uh, agri tech businesses that's had exposure, it's an extremely political space, extremely political space, okay. right? So, uh, and, and if, if I was an investor in such a company, I find that I have to play a significant role to help with the distribution and all that. And to be honest, I don't have the right experience in that space. Okay. Um, having said that, uh, there are boutique um, uh, venture funds that focus only in agri-tech, right? I don't know if there's one in any, in, um, any good ones in India, but I know of one in Israel, which uh, where the uh, fund managers um, have worked for the Nestle's, uh, Glencore's, Cargill's of the world. So they really have the skills uh, to help the companies they invest in. Okay. Yeah, Israel, uh, in Israel, export a lot of vegetables. I mean, they are, in, they are yeah. too good in horticulture, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of technology there. So, so how about like, you know, I'm, I'm actually in the coir space, coir pit, you know, which is used in greenhouses and, mm. you know, grow bags, you know, uh, and garden articles and all, all those. So, you know, predominantly my interest is in coir. And, you know, if you see the data in India, you know, mm. coir exports have been going up and up and, you know, every year, you know, it's, it has reached like 2,500 crores of, you know, coir exports. Uh, mm. So the data is very encouraging. So you know, have you so if uh, have you done any you know uh, investments in coir related industries? You know, no. Know? I I mean I understand it from a greenhouses perspective because you know I did look at the agri space. Uh, you know, um, in, in many years ago, um, as, as I said, for for reasons that I lost some money, I've not looked at it recently. You know, because coir becomes uh, part of your greenhouses, right, to support yeah. the plant. Yeah, it goes, goes so it's a, it's a, yeah. So I, I understand the business, but as I said, you know, you need to give me a compelling proposition, right? As to okay. why, you know, I'll make my 10x return, right? So okay. look, you know, it's, it's just the way it is, right? That's, that's life, you know. You know, I'm struggling to raise money for my simulator business, right? So, which I think is a lot more compelling. But, yeah. you know, that's but just the way it is. Not 10X, but it's not 10x, but, you know, I see coir exporters making a lot of money, but I do not know if it is in a very short period or if it is 10x, yeah. you know, those. Sure. Yeah. So, so, look, you know, you know there's, a, there's a different kind of investor for different investments, right? So, each one has their own preferences of what they like, what they don't like, right? So, that's just the way it happens. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. A lot of insights. Thanks a lot, sir. Okay, Saurav, any more questions? I think that was the last question, sir. So, uh, okay. on so, behalf of Tai Chennai, I would like to thank you, sir, for a very informative and an interactive section. A lot of questions were asked and answered, too. Uh, I'm sure participants had a good learning and a lot of clarity on the questions asked. So, thank you so much for that. Uh, I would also like to extend my thanks to the participants who are part of the session today. Uh, so our next and the third session is on uh, Wednesday, 19th of August, 5 p.m. And the session will be on part one of fundraising, which includes business model, business plans, etc. So looking forward to your participation in the next session. too. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Mm, yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you so much.